practically speaking, let's talk about the, the um, fight for ballot. Tell me how that's played out across other states. I know you said you have some data spot in Texas. Yes. What are the mechanisms behind the mail? So practically speaking, what do you have to do to make sure that you get ballot? Many of the states, so we're currently on the ballot in 23 or 24, okay. and we have ballot access battles going on in about another uh, 20, 23, 4 states. In many of them, uh, the state parties are well uh, positioned to get their ballot access. They have fought these battles before. Usually it's collecting signatures, sometimes it's party registrations. Uh, so there are many uh, struggles going on there. There are some states which have extremely difficult and high thresholds. Illinois and Pennsylvania, for example, you'll also get dragged into court and you'll get challenged and then you risk uh, being held responsible hefty for court hefty court fees, you know, millions of dollars. So these are very difficult high stakes battles and uh, we basically need to have a lot of volunteers out there in the field collecting those signatures. So far, knock on wood, we haven't missed any ballot access thresholds or deadlines. Okay. People so are fighting angry and are determined that the public voice not be locked out of this election. It's actually, you know, the United States stands apart from all other democracies, mm -hmm. effectively, in making it, in basically wiping out the opposition by allowing the political establishment to define its own um, you know, its own opposition, to define them out of existence, basically. Is there any likelihood that you might reach the, what is it, 15 percent mark public opinion poll threshold just to make it at any of the debates, or is that, is ballot access really the, the, the main new chance? Uh, the first uh, issue is the ballot access, because that really has to be front-loaded. Yeah. Once we've done that, you know, then then the fight is to get the word is there, out. Is there a strategy to try to see if you can place well in the yeah, exactly. And, you know, the strategy is a pretty much a common sense strategy, which is to mobilize those networks. They are already existing as networks. They're on the ground networks that are fighting for climate, that are fighting, uh, you know, for immigrant rights, that are fighting for, uh, you know, for decent wages. There are networks very broad with students, for example, you know, who are basically indentured servants. There are 30 million of them students and recent graduates who are, who are fighting the debt mm -hmm. crisis. And they're well networked and they're on Facebook. So just getting word out to students alone uh, could go a long way to getting to that 15%. Add to that the uh, cannabis network, mm -hmm. which is also very well networked. You know, you, you got 15% essentially okay. right there. So it's not impossible and, it, you know, and it's the model of the organizing that went into Tahrir Square in Tunisia. And, and we have the makings of that right now because we have a generation that has been locked out of jobs, that's been locked out of education, and that's been locked out of a climate future. Mm -hmm. They don't need persuading. I guess I really have just one more question for sure. you. I mean, it's, um, I mean, what do you say to, to a progressive um, that's been aligned with the Democratic Party for a long time who may feel fed up with the process, who may feel fed up with um, particularly the Obama administration on things like environmental protection, immigration policy, and other things. Um, but would rather vote for Obama despite their misgiving because they're afraid of what the Republicans do. So they're afraid of the Romney. I mean, what, well, what do you say to convince somebody like that? For one thing, I said I lived under Mitt Romney for four years. Okay, I also debated him and was declared winner in the debate. It's really easy to win the debate either with Romney or Obama for that matter, because they can't tell the truth. They really can't talk about what's happening. Um, you know, and I would just mention that when power shifted from uh, Romney to Deval Patrick, the poster child of progressive Democrats, you know, governors, it was really indistinguishable. Uh, Deval Patrick kept many of the same cabinet appointments and, you know, certainly, uh, Deval Patrick was not better. In some ways, he was even worse uh, on the environment, on corporate loopholes, things like that. You know, so at least with Romney, you know what you're getting. You know, and and with Obama, he'll tell you one thing, but then he'll sort of do uh, he'll do what Romney said. You know, and and that the Republicans may be, you know, the lunatic fringe, but on the other hand, the Democrats are just caving to them, case after case. 
We're, we got two establishment ships right now, which are both going down. And even the Democrat who votes Democratic, the progressive who votes Democratic, is not saying that the Democratic ship is going to get us to the Golden Shores. They're not. They agree it's going down. So, you know, the point is, open up your eyes here. There's one future here for both of these ships, and it's at the bottom of the ocean. You know, when, when you're on a sinking ship, you don't want to just get into another ship which is also sinking, but not quite as quickly. That we don't have time to fool around here anymore. That we've got a climate, you know, there was a report issued just last week saying it may be this century, it's not just the climate, it's also environmental degradation and overpopulation, mm -hmm. that we may see the whole thing, the whole house of cards could come down uh, this century. You know, so it's no longer some distant, vague, uh, problem, you know, it's happening right in front of our eyes right now. It's extremely immediate. There is no solution to the to the economy. The economy could spiral out next week, even. Nobody is uh, mincing words about this. The establishment has really proven itself absolutely incapable of fundamental change, and to allow them to muzzle you again, to go to the polls and use your vote as a weapon against yourself against the health care that you need and could have and that we can afford, against the public higher education that you deserve, against the loan forgiveness which you deserve and which we can afford, against the you know international policy based on human rights and international law, which is the only way forward, which they will not do. They will not uh, you know, they will not create the jobs that we desperately need. They will not support, you know, why did Walker win again and the Democrat lose? Because the Democrat in Wisconsin was not capable of actually energizing and galvanizing the movement that put him on the ballot. He himself had, you know, had cut $19 million from, uh, from public workers in Milwaukee, you know, as, as mayor. So he, he's, he was a Governor Walker himself, you know, though not as extreme. So in case after case, you have the Democratic Party just sort of being the Republicans' light. They're not solving it. They're just killing us not quite as quickly. That's not a solution. And I'd say remember what Alice Walker said. The biggest way you give up power is by not knowing you have it. The corollary to that is let's gain power by recognizing we got it. We got it, the public is with us, and the win here is not only the White House, the win is by driving these solutions forward into the public debate where they can't be stopped. Otherwise, we're gonna keep going over the cliff. But to simply change the debate, and then to be prepared to get out and fight for it, and demonstrate for it, and rally for it, it will take that social movement, which is alive and well out in the street, and it takes an electoral movement to keep driving it forward and um, frame the issues, articulate the demands. That's how we make history together. And uh, we've got in this election an incredible opportunity of a lifetime to turn a breaking point into a tipping point and to start taking back the promise of democracy and the peaceful, just, green future that really is within our reach if we stand up and not take no for an answer, starting now. Thank you. Thank you. My background. Okay, so I am a medical doctor by training and a mother. And when people say, so what kind of medicine are you practicing? I say, I'm practicing political medicine because it's the mother of all illnesses. Mm -hmm. And we got to fix this one if we want to fix all the other things that are desperately broken and are literally and figuratively killing us right now. So, I mean, you know, my personal background is, uh, you know, I was not a politically active person. I was a lot of who is mobilizing and standing up right now. I was not a member of any political party. You know, I was a, um, a mom and I was, you know, working in the health clinic and just observing that uh, our kids were really in trouble with this epidemic of asthma and learning disabilities and autism and cancers and things that never used to happen to kids and obesity and diabetes. And I said to myself, you know, our genes didn't change overnight what's going on here. So I got involved with community groups and with health advocacy groups to try to get our health care system back so it could actually do its job and also to try to get to the community drivers 
which is where health and disease is really determined. We don't get to health by handing out pills in the clinic. And I didn't feel good doing that, although it's important, and we need that to happen too, but that's not the answer. Yeah. We gotta stop pushing people into chronic disease and desperate illness through pollution, you know, through a food system which is making us sick, is thoroughly toxic, a transportation system that makes it unsafe, you know, to get out and ride your bike to go to work or for your kids to walk to school, and by poverty, you know, which itself, poverty and homelessness, uh, you know, and the oppression of our civil liberties, which are very much drivers of chronic stress and chronic disease. So, to make a long story short, that's how I got involved at the policy end. Not political at all, and it took me about 10 years of just working on when you policy. Say, when you say the policy end, I mean, what were you doing? I became an advocate, okay. you know, and uh, I helped community groups try to go to our legislature on bended knee and say, oh, please, please, you know, instead of funding the, um, you know, the, the incinerators that are polluting our fish supply and, and our air and so all the rest. Like Instead of that, well. let's right and let's fund uh, recycling because it creates jobs and it prevents the pollution. Okay. We did a lot of work on that, and we discovered that the harder we worked, you know, the faster we were backsliding. And it took me about ten years as an advocate to realize that's what the game is all about. It's to tie you up being a powerless advocate, so-called lobbying. But the truth is, the only way to really lobby is with money. And if you are not a rich corporation, you know, or a CEO, forget the lobbying. The lobbying the real, is all about the money. How do the real people lobby? I mean, how do people, how do, how does the public... Do oh, well, you think I'm going to go, I go educate, right? I'm going to educate my elected officials. I'm going to tell them, I'm going to get a petition. I'm going to show how many people really care about this. We lobbied with, with science. We lobbied with truth. We lobbied with public opinion. We lobbied... Um, you know, with the implied voter power. Yeah. But implied voter power is not a voter threat. Yeah. And as uh, Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without the demand. Mm -hmm. And just the implied threat doesn't do it. You actually, and then for me, the last straw, okay? After we saw all these health and, and environmental and job creating initiatives fail one after the other, because of the power of money in politics, we thought, okay, let's get the money out of politics. So what did we do? We ran a referendum in Massachusetts that won, by a two to one margin, we won public financing for campaigns. We got campaign finance reform. That was gonna fix it, right? Except that the legislature then, a Democratic legislature, 90% Democratic, turned around and repealed it on a voice vote. For me, that was the last straw that was why I joined the Green Party as the way that we actually get to critical mass so we can bring together the advocates, ordinary citizens fighting for decent wages for jobs that, that provide a living and that make our communities healthier, not making bombs to you know destroy other communities, that respect immigrant rights as human rights, uh, that provide a health care system as a human right that saves us trillions of dollars while providing health care for everyone. We all get together. That's how we get to critical mass. That's what a political party is all about. It's about the big vision that brings everybody in, and it's about sitting down and creating a strategy that makes sense in real time for what you're going to focus on, given the realities on the ground this year. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for your interest.